Okay. Well, it's good to be back in the Great Lakes. Um, and I'm going to take you back to May 27th, 2012. So I'll give you a second to think about where you were on that date if you were in the Great Lakes region. Uh, it was a warm year, if you remember, uncharacteristically warm year. Temperatures in Lake Erie were uh, around 70 degrees Fahrenheit along the Ohio shoreline. Uh, that's Memorial Day weekend, so it's actually Memorial Day itself, May 27th. Uh, so it was a warm year. It was kind of the unofficial kickoff to, let's say, the summer season. A lot of people were out in the lake on the beaches that day. Um, that afternoon, a series of uh, convective uh, events, basically a couple of th thunderstorms moved across the lake. You can see them coming across right now, across the central basin. This is the radar from that day. And essentially, at about 1.30 p.m., eyewitnesses near Cleveland that were on the beach reported three waves, about five minutes apart and about seven feet tall, uh, hitting the shoreline. Pretty much the same time down the coast in Lakewood, the Coast Guard reported three people had to be rescued when their boat capsized when a six foot wave uh, hit the boat. And then about four hours later, further up the coast eastward near Perry, Ohio, a marina was swamped. And a few minutes later, three swimmers were swept out into the lake. They had to be rescued by jet skiers that just happened to be in the water nearby. At this time, the Coast Guard called the weather forecast office in Cleveland to kind of I guess, inquire about what was going on. And the Coast Guard, sorry, the, the weather forecasters looked at, you know, the data available to them. They had been tracking the thunderstorms, of course, uh, but they looked at the, the water level gauge at Cleveland, which is being shown here. And they noticed around the time when that first, uh, those first series of waves were reported, um, they could see, you know, a little bit of indication that in the water level record. And then when we saw that, uh, the swimmers get swept into the lake. We see this drawdown of water at just about the right time. Again, this is a little bit further away from that location, but roughly showing us that something happened at that point. But these magnitudes don't really explain boats being capsized and people being swept out into the lake and all these kinds of features. And you can see there, it's about you know, 10, 20 centimeter differences here, not uh, two meters like what was reported. But they could definitely see that there was something kind of before and after say noontime uh, roughly, or when that first event happened. So while waters were a little calmer for the first half of the day and a little bit more going on from a water level signal standpoint after that. Now, again, they've been tracking the thunderstorms that day. So again, here's the radar imagery of that system moving across the central part of the lake. They look closer at the uh, radial velocities from the radar gauge near Cleveland. We can see uh, some imagery there of uh, basically these outflow boundaries from the thunderstorm, these kind of like wind gusts that look like these kind of series of waves that, we, that were reported in the lake itself. So again, this is the atmosphere that we're looking at here. But again, something certainly happened at that time. But when they looked at the forecast models, so the GLCFS, which has been mentioned uh, over the last couple of days in this session, uh, that system which predicts water levels and waves, we really saw nothing in the wave model. And when they look at the water level uh, aspect of, of the, the now cast, which is shown in this kind of dashed line that almost looks like it's the zero line, that's how calm the model thought it was that day. We compare this with the dots here, which are the observations from the Fairport, Ohio gauge, which is a little closer to that, that area where those swimmers were sucked out into the water. And we can see that really the observations look very different than the model now cast from that day. Now I'll mention that the observations are every six minutes, the models every hour, and that's part of the problem. So this really kicked off what became uh, the commencement of meteor tsunami research in the US. Um, this event uh, was the first one that we documented, and I'll, I'll talk about this in a second. But really it made us think about this situation when the weather forecast uh, uh, office basically approached this, um, this problem and couldn't explain it, they called Glural that day or the next day, I guess it's Tuesday, because it would have been a holiday. Nobody would have been at Glural on Monday, except for maybe Glenn. Um, <laughs> and so they said, what happened? And that really, we didn't have an answer, right? We, we couldn't come up with something. But long story short, we looked at this scale. And so this is a spectrum of wave period. So on the left are wind waves, the kind of waves that you go down to the shore and see with your eye. They come by every few seconds. Um, the GLCFS, the Mark Donilon wave model that was mentioned, the Glural Donilon model predicts these kinds of things quite well. On the right is SAGE, right? So these basin standing, uh, standing wave, uh, basin scale systems that we're familiar with in the Great Lakes that have periods on the order of several hours. Also the GLCFS predicts those quite well. 
But in the middle is this gap, was and still is this gap in forecasting, right? So what's in that middle? Well, people on the ocean coast might tell you that these are where long waves like tsunami waves exist, right? We don't really have the danger of seismic tsunamis happening in the Great Lakes. I suppose we could get something. Um, but that kind of wave can be created by not just seismic activity, like an earthquake out in the middle of the ocean, but also from weather conditions or what we call meteo tsunamis. So meteorological tsunamis. And this is actually what happened on that day. And what, of course, this talk will be out because it's, uh, it's in the title. But we got a lot of pushback in those early years when we started talking about meteo tsunamis, um, sometimes from our favorite TV meteorologists that were meteo tsunami deniers. And I think a lot of them have come around. Um, and a lot of that pushback was, isn't this just a seish? Why don't you just call it a seish? And so the Glittoral Communications team actually put this together a few years ago, and I love it. So it's a cross-section of a lake. Um, on the left-hand side is a meteo tsunami simulation, and you can see that it's a propagating wave, right? It moves through space. It's much steeper. It looks very different than the right image, which is a seish, right? And so you can get a sense of these standing waves as they oscillate back and forth. And again, the time scales are different. The spatial scales are different. It's fundamentally a different kind of wave. Uh, we'll hope this goes on. It's thinking. Okay, here we go. So what causes these things? Well, essentially, as you saw in that Lake Erie event, um, maybe the easiest way to think about it is just picture a thunderstorm, like a squall line or something like you see here. And basically those storms have generally a jump in wind speed associated with the front of them, a change in air pressure, and they move over the water. And as that happens, Right. If we just think about the pressure part of that, this inverse barometer effect, it creates a, wa a wave in the water below. And here's the key piece. If that storm is moving at pretty much the same speed that that wave is moving through the water, they're resonant. And the atmosphere can continually pump energy down into the lake and grow that wave. Right? And this was when you get essentially conditions right for a meteo tsunami. And it becomes even more hazardous or dangerous when that wave reaches shore and it shoals right, from the shallow water, where it gets into a harbor where it can also resonate with that harbor, right, and we, and we get dangerous situations, possibly like we had uh, on that day in, in Lake Erie. Hopefully this comes up. This is an animation of a meteor tsunami. We'll look at a few more. This is moving through Lake Michigan. I think Chin's group did this animation um, for a historic event. You can see here how it hits that southern coast, and then it doesn't stop, right? It reflects, it refracts, it gets focused towards, in this event, towards Chicago led to a catastrophic situation that we'll talk about in a second. So again, this Erie event was the first recognized meteor tsunami event in the US. Right? This is the first time we actually said that's what this thing was. We put out a paper, I think the first paper in the US on meteor tsunamis. And again, we got a lot of pushback in the early years and I think it's because these are generally misunderstood. So when we say meteor tsunami, the weather forecast officers themselves were like, we are not saying that word. And I maybe a few do now, but not many. Um, and I think it's because people picture this, right? Maybe something not so drastic, but it's not like a Hollywood movie poster of a, of a towering wave that crashes onto shore. In fact, they might not have a break to them at all. They lot, a lot of times look like a, a sudden rise in water level or a flood, not like a wave you might expect. And they're really only sometimes centimeters or maybe a meter or two tall, but they're about, let's say, 10 kilometers long. So calculate the volume of water that's going to come in in about six to 20 minutes. That's a lot of water to hit shore. That's the danger, right? That is the problem. Um, I am going to show one with a break. So this is rare footage of a meteor tsunami. Uh, maybe the first video, I don't know. Um, this is hitting the shore, the coast of Netherlands. So you can see what this, this wave looks like. Luckily, there was nobody out there because it was kind of a stormy condition, which is the good, the thing you want. That when these are timed with storms, usually people get out of the water. It's when you see that ricochet effect that we saw in that last animation where it hit Chicago several hours later in like in Lake Erie, when it's not timed with the thunderstorm, people don't see these things coming. So uh, actually through Sigler, um, Adam Beckley, one of Chin Wu's students uh, who was funded with a Sigler fellowship to work on this stuff, went through and took the painstaking process of digging up old newspapers and finding historic events in determining, in several cases shown here, where things were actually meteor tsunamis, but they were classified as tidal waves or seish or freak waves, basically just not understood. And we see that these happen uh, throughout over 100 years, I think is the oldest one that we found in the Great Lakes. 
And that work actually led to climatology, the first ever meteor tsunami climatology in the US that showed us that meteor tsunamis hit every lake uh, and they hit several times a year. There are hot spots, Southern Lake Michigan and Lake Erie seem to be where we see most of the activity, but it's driven by water level gauges, right? So we don't always know where these things are hitting. That inspired others, other parts of NOAA. So um, dare I say copycats? No, good, good colleagues at NOAA came by and said, we're gonna do this for the East Coast. And they found that meteor tsunamis hit basically the whole stretch of the East Coast that you can see on that image on the right. They happen about 25 times per year there. We get more of them in the Great Lakes per year, not always catastrophic luckily, uh, but we get more events in the Great Lakes than they do on the East Coast. Adam also found when these things happen, so they happen all year round, but generally are tied with convective season. So like uh, April, May, June, July, August, that kind of time frame. But we see when, when these events happen in basically swimming season, we get these catastrophic events, right? So when they occur and people are out there, bad things happen is kind of the, the takeaway. The most famous event was Chicago, 1954. The animation is being shown here of that event. There were actually two waves that hit that year, one on June 26th, uh, eight people drowned from a three meter wave, a meteor tsunami that hits, that, uh, hits the shore. And then two weeks later, a second one came by that was actually listed as more severe, but didn't end up in any fatalities that day, but uh, a lot of damage and flooding near shore. There was actually a publication that came out by the Weather Bureau that year, but they didn't know what it was. So we actually have a lot of good scientific information documented from that event, we, even though they just uh, couldn't put together the full story. Um, a more recent catastrophic event, Warren Dunes, so in Lake Michigan in 2003, a relatively benign meteor tsunami by size standards came across the lake, but created rip currents all along the, the east coast of uh, basically Lake Michigan, and seven people drowned in, in response to that event. More recently, um, in Ludington, so Lake Michigan, uh, in 2018, it was actually Friday the 13th, April uh, of 2018, um, a series of atmospheric gravity waves, which you can see in the radar there, moved across Lake Michigan. And we can see from the, the Met Station there at Ludington, we see a spike in, in air pressure and wind speed timed with the front of that event. And this event was notice, notable for two reasons. The first is, it was well photographed. That video I showed you is one of very few documents of a meteor tsunami, what it looks like when it's actually hitting. Um, in the Great Lakes, we didn't have any footage of one until this event. We were somehow fortunate that two photographers, professional photographers, were on the beach that day randomly and took these photos. And I'll point out the photos on the left there are taken about 12 minutes apart, right? And if you recognize, that's the channel marker at Ludington there on the pier. So that thing is totally flooded within about a 12 minute time frame. And it's actually, again, thanks to the Glittle Comms team that tracked down these photographers, got us permission to use these, really help us document the case uh, of the situation and probably led to even the idea that the Chicago Tribune could even publish them, that even they knew about them. And again, the water level gauge there on the right shows you before and after that meteor tsunami hitting uh, from the water level gauge itself. Now, I'll mention, I call this the disaster that wasn't because you know here's again some of that event pouring over the harbor wall there. This happens in April. If this happens in July, it's catastrophic, right? Fatalities or injury or drownings are likely in this situation when you have that many people on the water and something rises up out of the water in you know, over 10 to 20 minute time frame. Now, the other reason that this is notable other than it was photographed is, as I mentioned, these were atmospheric gravity waves. So it wasn't a thunderstorm that rolled across. And this is important. Thunderstorms are hard to predict. Right, the information we needed from a thunderstorm to put into a lake model, it's got to be really precise and kind of the right ingredients. At weather models just really aren't there yet to that precision, but they can predict these things, atmospheric gravity waves. So what you're seeing is an animation from actually, essentially what is NOAA's weather forecast model. We ran a special version here, but um, it's showing the pressure field, uh, basically in the, looking at these waves as they move across the lake. And this is exactly what we need to be able to put into a model. And if we do that, we take that operational model output and stick it into another operational model, we can recreate this meteor tsunami event. As you're seeing here, two waves hit Ludington shore in this time frame. And this was all done using things that exist right now. The weather model running today can do this, right? The lake model running today can do this. With one big catch, this takes communication between those two models at about a, a frequency of every couple of minutes, not every hour. Right, so right now we take hourly weather forecasts, stick them in a model, and the model produces hourly output, and that doesn't cut it, right? 
but that's still a good thing. That's like a logistical problem. I'll let other people, you know, handle that. It's not a physics problem in this case, right? The physics can handle it. It now becomes maybe logistics in order to pull that off. And again, we can predict these things in that situation with fairly a high level of accuracy, both in timing and magnitude. And really the, the ingredients are there uh, to put out a forecast. It's not there yet, but, right? But you can see that some of these things are, are just around the corner. And I also mentioned that, you know, not only did, um, you know, Glural and Sigler kind of uh, recognize this first event, but really became part of what was like the dawn of meteor tsunami science globally. So you can see here, uh, all those points are where we've documented as a community where we um, have documented meteor tsunamis that have occurred. Again, the Great Lakes are certainly a hot spot. And, you know, 10 or 12 years ago, I guess, when that event hit, almost 12 year, years ago to the day, there really was almost nobody to call. The weather forecast office called Glural. I called Chin, right? And we maybe had a couple people in Croatia that knew what these things were, and that was it. And now the community's grown. We've had two world conferences on meteor tsunamis. We put out, I think, the first collection on meteor tsunami science here that's shown this, this book here, a collection of, of research from around the world. And it's not done yet. So um, I mentioned the rip current connection. Uh, again, so a, a Sigler fellow looked into the connection between rip currents being driven by meteor tsunamis. But they're not all catastrophic. Actually, meteor tsunamis are just another part of the wave spectrum, right? Whether you believe in them or not, they exist. <laughs> and when they're not catastrophic, they can still be important. Uh, a paper, another uh, student put out a paper about the connection between sediment resuspension and potentially containment transport, and meteor tsunamis playing a really outsized role in that, as well as more recently, um, interaction with coastal hydrology, so wetland functioning, right? And so meteor tsunamis, again, being part of this wave space that we've just ignored forever, actually can be quite important in addition to being hazardous. And I think with, I'll follow suit with as a, a lot of the talks in this session to point out just the huge number of people that went into even this weird little piece of science that's called meteor tsunamis, um, both at Glural uh, through time, as well as weather service partners that made that first call and have run these weather models to help us out. And then um, probably an endless list of Sigler and university partners uh, that have been involved in this too. So with that, say thanks. Thank you, Eric. We do have time for a couple questions. Steve has one. So I, I know you're not a meteorologist, but uh, <laughs> but I play one at these conferences. Yeah. So okay. <laughs> um, and what I mean by that is one who's responsible for forecasting something like this. I mean, what what would what might that look like? trying to forecast something like this uh, because they happen, happen so infrequently. Yeah, so I think, you know, the, the atmospheric gravity one, let's say we got these models to talk to each other quick enough, then you would, you would have a wave being created in the lake and, and they could put that out with a coastal hazard statement um, that the, that's currently put out for dangerous conditions near shore. And without that situation, you know, tying it to thunderstorm warnings, right? I, I think there's some some avenue to do that there, but it says something that like Bob Dukasher and, and others aren't doing that yet. So I think they're hungry to try to make that next step. But, you know, I think we need to do a little bit more about, um, number, you know, false positive rate and that kind of stuff. I think I asked this of Brian as well, but how do you determine the location that the meadow tsunami will take effect? based upon the direction of the storm is coming and the matched resonance, or how do you determine that? Um, so the, you know, the, the storm's creating the wave below. So generally that wave only sustains wherever that those conditions are right. And as they move, and if the storm's going too fast or too slow, the wave just basically peters out, right? Um, so if they're timed right, then it, it's moving with that storm. But then there's also some uh, like bathymetric steering. So in that Ludington event, I, I won't go back, but we could look at it sometime as it goes over the deep spot in Michigan. And then that deep spot starts to shallow. You can see the wave actually starts to turn a little bit and wraps around. Um, and that part actually got away from the storm a little bit. So it loses energy, but it's actually changed direction a little bit. So the models can help us with that. Um, but generally, if you're looking at the radar, that's a good indication for that first leg. What we see is these things pinball around after that fact, right? And so after it hits shore and moves away, now is disassociated with that storm, you need a model to do it, really. 